Hi, for this project you're going to need to use both Lightroom and Photoshop. When you're considering which photos to use for your cyanotype prints, I want you to consider that images that tend to work well in black and white are probably going to be your best bet. The factor that you need to consider is that luminosity data will sometimes mute a, a specific structure once you convert something to black and white and you need to understand what those tonal relationships are. So for example, this yellow and this green are probably relatively similar, similar in luminosity data even though they're very different in you know, actual colors. So it stands out very well here in color, not necessarily in black and white. The key is once you convert to black and white, and that's just as simple as clicking on black and white within the basic panel is that you can manipulate these relationships so that you can get nice contrast you can have different structures stand out in a way that will work very well with the print one of the ways you're going to want to do that is coming down here to this V and W palette and you if you click on this little circle it activates it now you can see we've got little triangles on either side if you click over the structure you want to brighten up, click and drag up will make it brighter and opposite, click and drag down will make it darker. So for something like this, I actually like it fairly bright. Uh, we want this to stand out against the sky so we might want to bring the sky values down a little bit and what's happening is in the background Photoshop is going to remember what colors are in the original color image and so it's going to affect everything that's you know for example yellows here everything that was blues here here greens we're going to affect everything that was green and maybe we want to bring that down a little bit now you can see that we're also changing the colors of the petal a little bit that's because the petal has is primarily yellow but the green of the stem also has a little bit of yellow in it and so we're changing both the yellows and the greens here in addition to using your mouse, you can also change these sliders here just by moving them back and forth, and sometimes that's a little easier for you. Once you get something that's in pretty good shape, uh, again, you, you can use all of the tools within Lightroom to really enhance the, the image to begin with, and, and that's a good idea. So uh, right now I've got an iris enhanced. This is just a preset you can get from the dropdown. I'm going to actually change this to exposure. We want to bring the exposure up just a little bit. We maybe want we want to add a little bit of dehaze, a little bit of clarity. And you can see how I'm subtly manipulating these tonal relationships and bringing out a little bit of additional detail. These are things that are going to make the cyanotype prints look better overall. Finally, before we go any further, I'm going to say done here. It's important for you to understand that the dynamic range, which is the, the range from shadows to, to very bright highlights, is relatively compressed when you're doing cyanotype printing. What that means is that you need to relatively ha or have your, your histogram data relatively compressed. We want to bring the shadows over a little bit. We want to bring our highlights over a little bit. Best way to do that is here in the basic tab and just move maybe this white slider a little bit maybe this black slider a little bit and you can see how the histogram changes in addition to how the image itself has changed now that we've moved this over you can see that there's no true black which is fine you can see this is all still going to be pretty dark right in here if you as i move my cursor over it take a look at the numbers that are down here and the closer to zero it is is the closer to, to pure black I still got a few values here that are are down in the single digits and that's probably too low so I'm going to go back to this radial view click to activate that again and then I'm going to move just the shadows up from from that area and so you can see it's a little easier to see the detail there and that's going to make for a better overall print once we're done with this step we need to bring it over into Photoshop in order to make it into a negative. At this point it's still a positive image and converting it to a negative will allow the print itself to be a positive. You need to have a negative in order to make a positive print. So if I right click then I can either go and do edit in Photoshop or open as a smart object in Photoshop. 
For this, I'm just going to go ahead and edit in Photoshop, and that's going to make a background layer. Okay, now that we're in Photoshop, you can see we've just got our plain background layer. It looks just like it did as we sent it over from Lightroom. The next step is to invert it, and so we're going to go File, Adjustments, and then Invert, and you can see that's Control-I. On a, a Mac, it's going to be Command-I. It's a little apple-shaped thing on the keyboard, and as soon as we do that, you can see that it's very different. The things that were shadows are now highlights. The things that were in highlights are now shadows. And if we pull up our histogram, you can see that this has basically inverted just the before and the after. You can see how these peaks have changed. That's very important. Again, this is going to allow us to make a positive in our final prints from this digital negative. So from this point, I want to do actually a little bit of cropping. I could have cropped it in Lightroom. Um, it doesn't really matter too much either way. But what we have here is an image that would print out in a, a native form of, this is going to be an 8 by 12. I'm going to make it so it's an 8 by 10 so it fits better onto an 8.5 by 11 sheet of transparency media. So I'm going to click on my crop tool and you can see this first drop down will give ratios. And so if I go to 8 by 10, automatically it's it's set in the wrong direction so I want to change that just by these these little arrows and then I'm going to move it a little bit I'd, I'd like this to be maybe somewhere in there uh, one of the things that we we consider for photography is the rule of thirds and you can see how we've got these this grid here anytime that you have these areas of overlap on these lines that's an important visual part of the image. And so moving the, the main flower and the dead flower more or less over those those points will be a, a much more dynamic composition than if they were just centered. Generally speaking, there's always going to be exceptions to the rules. Now that we're here, I'm going to compress my dynamic range just a little bit. The way I like to do that is with curves. And I'm going to flatten out these mid-tones just a little bit. I'm going to move this up just a little bit and I'm going to move these down a little bit. Again, we, we don't want to be too far into the shadow area so I'm going to move this slider over a little bit and the same thing with the highlights. So you can see how that looks kind of before and after. Having a little bit of a compressed image for your, your negative is going to make a more even exposure once you get in your gets your get your contact printing out in into the sun. Now what you see is actually some pretty good ridges here. We lose a little bit of that detail by compressing it. And so now what we're gonna do is use a brush. We're gonna paint with black and a relatively low opacity and flow and if I right click here you can see a zero percent hardness. I'm gonna make my brush just a little bit bigger and then paint on my layer mask and I'm going to mask away some of the edit that I just did. It's okay to have a relatively flat overall. This area on the petals I think needs to be a little bit more contrasty in order to get the detail. And so I'm just going to go through and, and click on, on this. I'm sure you can hear in the, in the background I have multiple little clicks rather than one big long painting and that's really the way to do it. As I finish this you can see I turn it on and off again. We're getting some of that detail back. I think we're pretty close to where we want to be. We can see ridges, we don't see so much contrast that it's going to make for a, a really difficult exposure. As you get more experience with your contact printing uh, with cyanotypes or any other method really, then this step becomes less necessary. And the, the more skilled you are with the technique, the, the more you're going to be able to, to just trust that you can manage the high contrast areas with a single exposure. That's kind of beyond the scope of, of this first assignment. But just understand that there are ways that, that you can deal with that without having to, to flatten out your negative in this sort of way. I'm actually pretty happy with that. 
and at this point I'm going to save it because it's always a good idea to save your, your work as you're, you're going through and once that's done there's going to be really two ways that you can you can deal with this first of all you can if you have your own printer you can purchase transparencies and print yourself if that's the case then make sure that the transparencies that you purchase are uh, the appropriate ones to use for the type printer you have. If you have an inkjet printer, make sure you're using inkjet media. If you're using a laser printer, make sure you have a laser printer media. Just standard overhead transparencies are going to be okay for this assignment. Understand that there are, are much better negative media available if you wanted to do this on a more serious basis than just for this assignment. One of the, the big ones is, is PictoRico, and I'll post a link for that in the classroom. If you are going to not purchase your own transparencies, the other option is to save it as a JPEG image. Take that JPEG then on a flash drive or whatever to FedEx office and have them print for you. As of this recording, it costs 75 cents to make a single transparency so it's, it's relatively inexpensive in order to do that we do file export and then I like to use this save for web legacy and you can see it, it shows you as a preview again this is relatively flat but we can see some detail here and so this is going to work pretty good for a sample we'll do save and then it's just a matter of saving it someplace where you can find it. And I'm just going to say wildflower. Then that file I would take to FedEx office and, and have them print it if I wasn't going to do it myself. If I was going to print it myself, then I would do file, print, and make sure that the appropriate printer is selected. I'm actually going to use a laser printer for this. 8 by 10 is the, the right size for the transparencies I'm making. Once you get over here, you want to make sure that you choose landscape if, if that is obviously appropriate for you. And then come down a little bit to, to scale to fit media. If you click on that, it automatically fits within the window of your 8.5 by 11 sheet. Printer manage colors is appropriate. Once you finish that, go to print settings, and because this is going to be on transparency, it almost automatically is going to mean that you need to do manual feed. You can feed your printer however is appropriate for your for your own printer. Do OK, and then OK print, and it'll go through the, the process for you. Make your negative transparencies, and if you have any questions about whether or not something is going to make for a good negative or not, by all means, send me a low-res version, and I'll be more than happy to evaluate it for you before you make your transparency prints. And I'll, I'll give you any pointers, should you need it, to make sure that your negatives are going to be as good as possible. Let me know if you have any questions.